Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Dr. Mashmi Das, and today I'm going to be continuing my series on the anatomy of nose as I started in my last class where I spoke about the external nodes. So today we'll be starting with the internal nodes and how we divide the internal nodes into the vestibule and the nasal cavity proper, the boundaries of the nasal cavity proper. And also we'll be talking about the nasal valve. So let's start our class now. So today's topic is going to be about the internal nose. Now the internal nose we can divide it into right and the left nasal cavities with the help of the nasal septum which is a midline structure. Now each nasal cavity it communicates with the exterior through the nares or the nostril which is right over here. So this is the nares or the nostril via this the nasal cavity communicates with the exterior whereas on the other hand it communicates with the nasopharynx which is right over here with the help of the posterior nasal aperture also known as the coana which is this particular region. So these are the beginning and the end of the nasal cavity. Now each nasal cavity it consists of two parts the vestibule which is the skin lined portion if you see in this picture this region here it is the vestibule this is the uh, portion which is lined by skin and the nasal cavity proper which is the rest of the nasal cavity uh, from here this whole region and this region is lined by mucosa so let's talk about the next part which is the vestibule the first part of the nasal cavity now what is the vestibule the anterior and the inferior most part of the nasal cavity is termed as the vestibule this serves as an entry point from the external nares into the nasal cavity now what is it lined by the lining epithelium is a keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium as I said it is lined by skin and also it has coarse hair which is known as vibrissi as you can see in this picture over here these coarse hair as you can see here is known as vibrissi and this region also has sebaceous and sweat glands and how do you mark the limit of uh, upper limit of the vestibule the upper limit is on the lateral wall it is marked by a structure known as the Lyman nasi also called as the nasal valve. So as you can see the vestibule is the first skin lined portion is the entry into the nasal cavity the most anterior and inferior part it is lined by keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium and it has vibrissi sebaceous glands and sweat glands and its upper limit is the Lyman nasi if you see in this picture over here it is present on the upper uh, lateral wall of the nose this limit is also known as a nasal valve so what is this nasal valve nasal valve is very important to know about because a lot of pathologies of nasal obstruction occurs because of this nasal valve so there are two valves the external nasal valve and the internal nasal valve first of all the external nasal valve the boundaries of it are laterally it has the alar rim as you see in this picture over here laterally it has the alar rim uh, which is formed by the lateral crust, the sesamoid complex and the fibro fatty tissue. Medially it has a cartilaginous nasal septum and inferiorly it has the nasal sill. So in this picture marked 1, 2 and 3 you can see laterally is the alar rim which is marked by number 2. Medial is the cartilaginous nasal septum and inferiorly is the nasal sill. This particular region is known as the external nasal valve and what is its importance its importance lies in the fact that any anatomical abnormalities or any compromise in the structural integrity of any of these three components will cause an external valve narrowing a stenosis or a dynamic valve collapse which gets exacerbated during inspiration as you see in this picture over here you can see that 
the nasal valve collapse has occurred this leads to nasal obstruction which is exacerbated more during inspiration so this is about the nas external nasal valve next is the internal nasal valve now what is this structure now now internal nasal valve is this region is the least cross sectional area of the nose this is important to remember the word least and this region regulates the air flow and resistance on inspiration so if we are to study the boundaries of it uh, medially it is lined by the septum as you see over here medially lies the septum laterally lies the caudal edge of the upper lateral cartilage and the head of the inferior turbinate which is right over here this is the lateral boundary you can see this is the head of the inferior turbinate and this is the caudal end of the upper lateral cartilage and inferiorly lies the nasal fold floor so these three structures are forming the boundaries of the internal nasal valve now if you were to see in relation to the external nasal valve you can see the difference this right here is the internal nasal valve this is the upper lateral cartilage its free uh, lower border is forming one of the boundaries of the internal nasal valve whereas for the external nasal valve we can see the lateral boundary is formed by the alar rim so this is the difference between the internal and external nasal valve position now why is this valve important because changes in the relationship of any of these three structures which are forming the boundaries will cause a uh, a narrowing of this space this cross sectional area of the nose leading to symptoms of nasal obstruction a very significant clinical test that we can do to find out the involvement of the internal nasal valve in nasal obstruction is the cotal test so what is uh, what is this cotal test what do you do you, what you do is you pull the cheek away from the midline as we, as it is being shown in this picture over here you pull it away from the midline if the nasal airway improves on that tested side the test will be called as a positive test and it will indicate an abnormality in the nasal valve on that side so this is a very important test which we do on a clinical examination of the nose that helps us to understand if the nasal obstruction is occurring due to an abnormality in the internal nasal valve next we move on to the nasal cavity proper so so far we studied about the vestibule we studied about the nasal valve the external and the internal one now we move on to the nasal cavity proper and we'll study about the boundaries of it so each nasal cavity as you can see in this picture on the first picture over here it has a lateral wall it has a medial wall a roof and the floor so there are four boundaries to it and as i said uh, anteriorly it communicates to the exterior through the nares and posteriorly with the nasal pharynx to the cuana so first we'll talk about the roof now the roof you have to see in the second picture over here as i will be delineating the structures which is forming the roof so the anterior sloping part of the roof is formed by the nasal bones and the nasal spine of frontal bone this here is you can see this is the nasal bone and this is the nasal spine of the frontal bone so together these two structures are forming the anterior sloping part of the roof next comes the posterior sloping part which is formed by the body of the sphenoid bone so as you can see over here this is the sphenoid bone and here this is forming the posterior sloping part of the roof and the middle horizontal part is formed by the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone through which through which basically there are a lot of uh, small openings uh, through which the olfactory nerves enter the nasal cavity so this right here is the cribriform plate so these three uh, three parts of the roof are being formed by all of these bones now the importance uh, of this roof why do we need to know how this roof is oriented why is it sloping downwards why do we need to know that the roof is sloping posteriorly or anteriorly is because while we are putting in an endoscope in the nose we have to remember that the roof it slopes downward anteroposteriorly 
and this is important to recognize during endoscopic sinus surgery as we are progressing towards uh, dissecting towards the sphenoid sinus which lies posteriorly so if we were to straight on directly introduce the endoscope through the nasal cavity and if we didn't know about the this angulation the sloping anterior posteriorly we would go straight ahead and we would end up destroying the structure over here which is the cribriform plate so we'd have to know about this angulation that takes place from anterior to posterior so that we do not injure any structures in the roof which is the cribriform plate or the olfactory nerves passing through it or the sphenoid sinus over here now the olfactory fossa as i was telling you the uh, above the cribriform plate uh, we know that the olfactory fossa is present over there and it is formed by the horizontal lamella of the cribriform plate its vertical lamella and a part of the orbital plate of the frontal bone so if you see in this picture this region here is a cribriform plate so the horizontal lamella and the vertical lamella are helping in forming the cribriform plate as uh, sorry the olfactory fossa also the orbital plate of the frontal bone now the depth of this particular fossa uh, has been classified by kiros this is known as a kiros classification of the olfactory fossa into three types so uh, as you see in this picture over here on the left side this region here is the olfactory fossa this is the normal depth whereas when this depth becomes a lot more like in this second picture this is known as a deep olfactory fossa so this depth is classified by kiros into type 1 which states that this depth is 1 to 3 mm as you can see over here this depth over here is 1 to 3 mm type 2 is 4 to 7 mm as you can see the depth has increased over here and type 3 is 8 to 17 mm so these are the three olfactory fossa classification according to kiros on the basis of its depth now why uh, what is the importance of uh, olfactory fossa we'll see that the olfactory fossa is most often symmetrical bilaterally but in case of a break in the horizontal portion of the cribriform plate sometimes what happens is the meninges they may descend into the upper recesses of the nasal cavity as you see over here in this picture that we can see some opaque shadow over here this is uh, the meninges which has prolapsed because of a break in the crib horizontal part of the cribriform plate and they have descended into the nasal cavity Now the olfactory fossa in this case will appear asymmetrical on coronal CT scans, and this sign is known as a Kairos rectus sign. It's a very important sign, and what this sign indicates is that this that it is the site of breach in case of CSF rhinorrhea. So. this is why we need to see in a ct scan whether there has been any breach in the horizontal portion of the cribriform plate or not the olfactory nerves they pass through this cribriform plate to reach the nasal cavity so sometimes what happens is these foramina may appear like breaks in the in a detailed 1 mm coronal ct scan so sometimes you might think of it uh, that it this may look like as if there is a breakage over there and that is where the csf leak is occurring from but we should bear in mind this is absolutely a normal finding and in detail scans uh, we might get confused by looking at these cribriform foramina that they might look like a break in the cribriform plate whereas it is absolutely normal so these are the two important things about olfactory fossa that you must remember next we move on to the floor of the nasal cavity so the floor now when we studied the roof we studied that from anterior posteriorly it go, goes sloping whereas for the floor it is concave from side to side and it is flat anterior posteriorly and horizontally oriented now what are the structures forming it it is formed by the palatine process of the maxilla in its anterior 3/4 as you can see this is the palatine process of maxilla so the anterior 3/4 is formed by it whereas the 
posterior one fourth is formed by the horizontal part of the palate and bone, which is right over here. So this part over here is the posterior one fourth. So these are the two bones which are forming the floor of the nasal cavity, and approximately twelve millimeter behind the anterior aspect of the nasal floor is a slight depression which corresponds with the incisive canal. As you see in this picture over here, this is where the incisive canal is located. Twelve millimeter. This distance is twelve millimeter. Behind the anterior aspect of the nasal floor. Now, what you need to know about this incisive canal is that it contains the terminal branches of the nasopalatine nerve, and second structure that it transmits is the greater palatine artery. So, the nasopalatine nerve and the greater palatine artery, right over here. These are the two structures passing through the incisive canal. So we have covered uh, both the roof and the floor of the nasal cavity proper. So what remains is the medial boundary, which is formed by the nasal septum and the lateral wall of the nose. So in my next video, I'll be talking to you everything you need to know about the nasal septum. Now thank you for watching, guys. Please, please, please subscribe to my channel. See you in my next video.